It's a crisp and cold late afternoon at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, where, under a cloudless sky, light winds and a temperature uh, hovering right around freezing, a NASA astronaut, Russian cosmonaut, and British astronaut representing the European Space Agency are aboard a Soyuz spacecraft 160 feet atop a Soyuz booster, ready to launch a little more than one hour from now. At 5.03 p.m. local time at Baikonur, 4.03 this morning here in the U.S. Central Standard Time. This is a live view of the Soyuz rocket on the Site 1 launch pad at Baikonur. A team of launch controllers are watching over all systems aboard the rocket, which is now fully fueled and ready for launch. No issues have been tracked throughout the day, which began with uh, fuel and oxidizer loading shortly after midnight central, 1 a.m. Eastern Time. And good morning, everyone from the International Space Station Flight Control Room. This is Mission Control Houston. Along with flight control teams around the world supporting the space station program, here in Mission Control, the team is watching over the Expedition 46 crew and station systems and is preparing to support the increase from three to six crew members later today with the addition of Timothy Peake, the first British astronaut selected by the European Space Agency. Russian cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko, representing Roscosmos, the Russian Federal Space Agency, and NASA astronaut Tim Kopra. The three are about to begin a planned single-day flight to the International Space Station, with docking scheduled just six hours after launch at 11.24 a.m. Central Time uh, this morning, or 11.24 p.m. in Baikonur, where colleagues, friends, and family of the Soyuz crew will be watching the events unfold. The Soyuz TMA-19M will be docking with the Rosviet module, also known as MRM-1, uh, which is a port that faces uh, towards the nadir or the Earth-facing side uh, over on the Russian segment of the space station. The crew will be joining uh, current space station residents on board, uh, among them Expedition 46 Commander Scott Kelly and Flight Engineers Sergei Volkov and Mikhail Kornienko. Kelly and Kornienko are the one-year uh, mission space station crew and have been on board since March 27th U.S. time. They're now in their ninth month aboard the station. Uh, meanwhile, Sergei Volkov, who arrived back on September 4th, is going to be serving as the Soyuz commander, uh, bringing Ke home Kelly and Kornienko aboard the Soyuz TMA-18M in early March of next year. Here in Houston tonight, the team in mission control will be monitoring the, uh, the launch. Um, Houston this morning, rather, um, and getting updates on the flight from their Russian counterparts. Today's flight director is Dina Contella, and the Capcom there in the blue shirt joining her is veteran Japanese uh, astronaut from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, Koichi Wakata. During the Soyuz's climb to orbit, tracking and telemetry's downlink to ground stations along the flight path, and then routed through the Russian Mission Control Center located outside of Moscow. As of right now, though, we are 59 minutes and 40 seconds and counting away from the launch uh, of the three newest crew members for Expedition 46 to the International Space Station. This mission is going to be launching under the call sign Agat, uh, which is the Russian word for a lustrous gemstone, and the same call sign that's been used by Malenchenko on his previous five journeys into space. Uh, inside the Soyuz craft, you may see a talisman hanging over the commander's seat, the center seat, uh, during the ascent, uh, including a small circular medallion and a small toy rocket there to commemorate the 55th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's launch, which uh, occurred on April 12, 1961, when he became the first human to go into space. Two spaceflight veterans and one first-time flyer will be launching today aboard the Soyuz TMA-19M spacecraft to the International Space Station, starting off with NASA astronaut Tim Copra, who will be making his second trip into space today and his first aboard a Soyuz. His first space flight was more than six years ago aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour on mission STS-127, which brought two Japanese experiment segments to the International Space Station along with COPRA, who replaced Expedition 19 flight engineer Koichi Wakata for a two-month long-duration stay as a flight engineer of Expedition 20. He returned home with uh, STS-128 Shuttle Discovery uh, in September of 2009. Copra this time around will serve as, as an Expedition 46 flight engineer until the departure of Scott Kelly, Sergei Volkov, and Mikhail Kornienko in early March. At that point, he'll transition to commander of Expedition 47. 
and he'll be serving his nearly six months aboard ISS with another seasoned flyer. Veteran Russian cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko, who is going to be the commander of the Soyuz today, is making his sixth journey into space today. Malenchenko served as commander of the Russian Mir space station in 1994, served above shuttle mission STS-106 in 2000 uh, to prepare the International Space Station for its first resident crew, and spent three long-duration stays aboard ISS, uh, first in 2003 as commander of Expedition 7, in 2007-2008 as uh, Expedition 16 flight engineer, and again in 2012 as flight engineer of Expeditions 32 and 33. This flight will equal the most flights into space by a Russian cosmonaut, an honor currently held by cosmonaut Sergei Krikalov. So uh, a very veteran commander for the Soyuz craft today, a very veteran cosmonaut getting ready to make his sixth flight into space and uh, will just hours away be on board the International Space Station. And then joining uh, both Malenchenko and Copra is European Space Agency astronaut Timothy Peake, who will be venturing into space for the first time today. Former, Briti uh, former British Army Air Corps officer with more than 3,000 flying hours to his credit, Peake was selected for more than 8,000 applicants for the European Space Agency's astronaut training program back in 2009. He will be the first British citizen to fly to the ISS and the second British citizen to fly into space. The first was uh, researcher Helen Sharman, uh, who spent eight days in space aboard the Russian Mir station back in 1991. So we are still on track for an on-time liftoff today, again uh, coming at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 5.03 p.m. over in Baikonur. Everything proceeding well with the countdown so far, no issues being tracked. The weather out there, as you can see, crystal clear for today's launch from the Kazakh steppe. Uh, a little cold, but nothing holding this Soyuz rocket back from its uh, eventual uh, trip up into space. And uh, during the climb to orbit, tracking and telemetry from the Soyuz vehicle is downlinked to ground stations along the flight path and then routed to the launch control bunker near the launch pad in Baikonur and then over to the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow. The flight is controlled from the bunker until shutdown of the third stage engine when it's transitioned over to the Russian Flight Control Center. Just seconds after the Soyuz reaches orbit, the vehicle's command and control system will be activated and stored computer commands that will deploy navigation and communication antennas. The solar arrays will be deployed to begin collecting power for use by the onboard batteries in order to generate electricity for the Soyuz systems. The first antennas to be deployed will be the Coors Rendezvous and Docking antennas, which will be used later on to provide automated, automatic range and rate of closure information on the final approach by the Soyuz for its docking with the Rosviet module. Immediately after reaching orbit, the crew will oversee the programmed activation sequence of a variety of systems just before the spacecraft passes out of range of Russian ground stations. The systems include the spacecraft's power supply system, radio communication system, and the critical motion control system. And during the first uh, orbit of today's flight, the Soyuz will automatically execute the first two of several orbital adjustment burns uh, planned as the vehicle fine-tunes its path to the International Space Station. We copy and we are ready. And welcome back to our live coverage of the launch of Tim Coper, Yuri Malenchko, and Timothy Peake to the International Space Station. At this point, the launch vehicle's control systems uh, have been prepared and the control gyros activated. Uh, the Soyuz rocket itself stands 162 feet tall, weighing in at 680,000 pounds. Uh, it consists of the Soyuz TMA-19M spacecraft uh, inside a protective shroud at the top and the three-stage Soyuz FG booster below. 
The spacecraft was mated to its booster in Baikonur uh, back on Sunday, and the entire rocket uh, was then transported by rail car to the launch pad at about 7 a.m. Baikonur time on Monday. So as mentioned, the uh, entire spacecraft made it to its booster uh, in Baikonur. And then uh, back on Sunday, the entire rocket ready to transport via rail car out to the pad. Uh, the Soyuz uh, leaving uh, the assembly building at 7 a.m. on the dot, uh, as is the tradition uh, with the uh, departure of these crafts to the launch pad number one. Uh, Yuri Gagarin departing uh, almost 55 years ago at 7 a.m. for the first manned uh, mission into space. Uh, and since then, all of these uh, vehicles rolling out of the building at the exact same time. So the Soyuz spacecraft with its three crew members on board sit high above the three stages of the Soyuz booster, uh, which uses kerosene and liquid oxygen as the propellant. Uh, the first stage has four liquid engines uh, strapped to the side of the core vehicle. Each will burn for about 1 minute 58 seconds before they drop away. At that point, the rocket will be 30 miles high and downrange 73 miles with a velocity of 3,937 miles per hour. And in this animation, you can see uh, that first stage, the boosters uh, finishing their job and then dropping away uh, shortly after. Uh, the core engine of the first stage is also going to serve as the second stage and will continue to burn until 4 minutes 57 seconds into the flight. Altitude at that point will be 103 miles, downrange distance 179 miles, a velocity of 8,679 miles per hour. The third stage has a single engine that will ignite just before separation of the second stage, helping to push it away, and that will burn until 8 minutes 45 seconds into the flight. And at that point, the Soyuz will be in its preliminary orbit of 143 by 118 statute miles. And so our coverage continuing uh, here. Tim Cooper, Yuri Malenchko, and Tim Peake packed inside of the Soyuz and ready to launch to the International Space Station. All of the launch preparations continuing smoothly. Everything still on track for a launch today at 5.03 a.m. Central Time, 6.03 a.m. Eastern. In this in-cabin view, you can see the Soyuz commander, Yuri Malenchenko, there in the center seat. To his left, the left seater today, uh, Timothy Cooper, a NASA astronaut making his second flight. And then uh, just off screen to the left uh, in the right seat for today will be Timothy Peake, the European astronaut, the first British astronaut to fly as a European Space Agency astronaut, and also the first Brit making uh, his way to the International Space Station. Also a first flight for Tim Peake, and he will be the 221st uh, individual to visit the International Space Station. The crew was awakened at about 8 p.m. Central Time last night, uh, which was 8 a.m. local time over in Baikonur, which is roughly about nine hours prior to the launch. Uh, the crew members then participating in their final pre-launch activities. 
Wonderful you Before they departed uh, the Cosmonaut uh, Hotel the for the launch there. pad, all three crew members observed a long-standing tradition, photographing the doors uh, inside the Cosmonaut Hotel down there in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. Valenchenko having uh, written his name on these doors five times already. This is the sixth, first time for Peak, uh, and uh, the first time for Cooper as well as his previous flight uh, was uh, on board uh, NASA's uh, space shuttle. Uh, following the signing, they received a blessing, uh, as is tradition, from the, a Russian Orthodox priest still inside the Cosmonaut Hotel. Behind them, you can see God the backup God's crew for this launch, Kate Rubens, uh, Anatoly Ivanishin, and Taku, uh, Takuya Onishi. Uh, following all that, though, they were ready to uh, depart uh, the Cosmonaut Hotel. So at around 10.25 p.m. Central Time last night, 10.25 in the morning in Baikonur, uh, the crew departed, uh, making their way down to a bus for the ride over to the integration and suit-up facility also known as Building 254 uh, down at Baikonur, getting a chance to uh, wave goodbye to family members, friends, supporters, uh, program personnel from around the world, and uh, of course, media guests in attendance. <laughs> Party in July. <laughs> the bus is leaving now. Again, the three crew members departing uh, at around 10.25 in the morning over there in Baikonur. Uh, they arrived uh, at Building 254 at about 11.45 p.m. Central Time last night, 11.45 a.m. in the morning over in Baikonur. Each crew member underwent uh, their final medical exams and then got suited up in their Sokol launch and entry suits. Uh, the white suits, you can see the uh, technicians helping each of the crew members into here. And then once suited up, uh, each one of the crew members uh, got the chance to have their suit pressurized, uh, all of that being done in order to ensure the integrity of the seals in the suit. Uh, the actual suit up activities beginning at around 12.30 a.m. Central Time uh, this morning, uh, 12.30 p.m. in the afternoon over in Baikonur, which is about four and a half hours prior to launch. Just like this, yes, thank you. Looks great. Again, all three crew members getting suited up in their Sokol launch and entry suits. Uh, they then took turns one at a time to 
uh, pressure up, uh, pressurize the suits, all of that, uh, just to ins ensure the integrity uh, of the seals on the suit, make sure they're airtight prior to a launch. Um, as this is uh, going on uh, behind a uh, protective pane of glass, uh, all that to maintain their quarantine status, the crew uh, able to speak to various Roscosmos, NASA, and European Space Agency managers, as well as getting one last chance to speak with friends and family. Uh, this is the last chance for the crew to talk with everyone before they head out to the launch pad. Also a chance for them to relax uh, just uh, for a couple of minutes while the others are uh, taking their turn going through the leak check. Again, backup crew members Kate Rubens and Taku uh, Onishi on uh, on the scene there, uh, helping the crew members out in their final task prior to launch. Onishi and Rubens, along with Anatoly Ivanishin, uh, plan to launch uh, as part of Expedition 48. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And again, at this point, each of the crew members getting a chance to speak with family and managers. I would like to wish you a successful flight, a successful implementation of the entire flight program. And uh, the crew that is currently on board are looking forward to seeing you here from the ground. We will be watching your flight closely and we will be helping you if needed. So you are something like the ambassadors for us. The ambassadors in space, of course, for peace, but also ambassadors because we are not able to fly, so we are depending totally on what you are reporting to us. So we wish you all the best for the flight, a safe trip, and also, of course, also a safe uh, trip back. It's great to see you guys. Uh, the teams in Houston are all ready to support you on orbit. Space Station is ready for you. So have a good time on station, enjoy Space Station, and take good care of Space Station for us. Thank you. So once all of those preparations were behind them, the crew left Site 254, waving farewell to everybody as they walked down, prepared to uh, say farewell and uh, sign off with the Russian State Commission at the end of this walkway. Mr. Chairman, the Soyuz crew is ready. Good luck. All the best. And after that final moment, the crew members then boarded their bus at about 2 a.m. Central Time for the ride over to launch pad number one. The drive typically takes about 25 minutes. 
So the crew uh, able to arrive at the pad at about 2.25 a.m. Central Time, 2.25 p.m. Uh, out there in Baikonur. MISO's crew is ready for the mission. <laughs> this way, please. Once they were ready, the crew members waved goodbye at the pad, made their way up the stairs and got ready to board the elevator to the ride uh, to the top of the Soyuz rocket in order to board their capsule. Raise your, raise your right hand and wave, and wave. There we go. Got all three crew members loading into that elevator for the ride to the top of the Soyuz rocket in order to board their capsule. As of right now, they've been on board for about an hour and a half. Uh, the Soyuz rocket itself, billowing oxygen, as you can see, uh, was fueled about three hours prior to the launch. And at this point, the crew members again on board their Soyuz strapped in and everything continuing to march and count down uh, towards today's launch. Today's launch will mark the 10th time that a Soyuz vehicle is scheduled to dock to the orbiting complex on the same day, docking only four orbits or about six hours. Anything or without uh, hurting yourself. Well, we're back now with live pictures um, from Baikonur, and you can see that that service tower, the um, where the elevator was that they travelled up to the to the capsule at the top, that's now been uh, moved moved yeah, apart, like a pedal. Yeah. And um, we're a little over um, 35 minutes uh, before launch. No, 31 minutes to uh, uh, to, lo to launch hour. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little over um, half an hour to uh, launch. And um, the launch is due at 11.03 GMT. Um, so let's um, look at the spacecraft. Everything's uh, on track as far as, as, far as we know. Um, and uh, mission control, there's no reason why everything is not uh, going ahead. Uh, what's been happening? So we've seen in that period, and that's only two hours ago or so, where the um, service tower retracted. Um, fueling has, uh, has been underway. What other things have been happening to the, to the launcher itself? Um, well, of course, the, the launcher is under control of the ground, uh, of the launch center at that moment. And... Um, then it will be transferred to the Moscow uh, control center. Uh, so there are, for, of course, this structure was also made for the, for the crew to be able to access the vehicle. But you see there are still some, um, some, uh, some of these cranes are still attached to the different uh, stages of the rocket. So they are still fueling it. Uh, even if the big one is now opened, but uh, the, the fueling is still going. On. And there are, of course, some Command, commands and telemetry which are coming um, to and from the, the launcher to the launch center. 
And what happens in the next 30 minutes or so prior to launch? So the, they are waiting for mainly, I, th I think the, the launcher is probably ready now. Um, not well, for all the details, obviously, but uh, uh, th so they are waiting now for the launch window because, you know, for the, the Soyuz to be able to reach the station, uh, it's a very precise uh, launch maneuver. So you there can is see, a, you can see us a window here. that you went in that the plane of the station is, is really aligned with, um, uh, with the uh, launch site. Yes, because the uh, International Space Station flies over the Baikonur Cosmodrome just three minutes um, before I, launch. And that's just uh, once a day, I would say. So. Now, this is live pictures now from the International Space Station. Yeah, we can see on the right side the, uh, the new uh, cargo vehicle, a commercial vehicle, which is called Cygnus. And uh, it was uh, launched and, and grappled and installed on the station last week. So we're currently 410 kilometers above the Earth, traveling, although you obviously can't feel it, <laughs> 27,000 kilometers per hour in orbit uh, around the Earth. And um, can't quite picture from that image where exactly we are. It's hard to tell. Right uh, now. It looks like we're over a continent here, but. As you see, there, are, there is a lot of blue and white when you're up there, so the, you can see clouds and most of the time you see the, the, the ocean or the, the, the water on Earth. It was interesting in the, in the press conference, uh, Tim Peake was talking about his mission and what he's looking forward to most. Obviously, he's looking forward to the launch, he's looking forward to the experiments and the work he'd do on board, but he said the view was the... You know, that's what big we're thing. looking for, definitely. Mm. Yes, of course, the view. Even if you are very close to the Earth, I mean, it's a very different view compared to uh, the crews who went to the moon, for instance. Uh, but uh, we are only 400 kilometers above the Earth, so it's like being in a very high altitude airplane. Um, but the speed, of course, is uh, nothing you can see on an airplane. <laughs> it's much, <laughs> much faster. And it's compelling to watch, isn't it? You can yeah, just that's, uh, that's amazing. look and watch that. Yeah. So this is again the Columbus Control Center where we are above in a gallery overlooking that and uh, live now at um, Baikonur. Uh, the uh, launcher on the launch pad there. Beautiful, clear day. Just coming up towards the end of the day, you maybe see the, uh, the light going a little bit. Launch is due um, around about an hour before dusk and... Um, so we, we should get quite a good view, particularly as the, uh, the rocket uh, disappears, uh, assuming everything continues to go uh, to plan. You see the, um, the towers around the rocket. Now, some of those stay till quite near the, the last few seconds. True, yeah, because we are still feeding the, uh, uh, the, the rocket uh, stages with, uh, with propellant. And um, the crew, they have no window, they can't see out, I should nope, say. No, uh, not yet. Well, they have windows, they will have windows when the fairing is a jettison. And so they would just feel the launch in the first minutes in their body. And, uh, and then after uh, probably four or five minutes, when the fairing is a jettison, they will, have, uh, they will see the Earth, finally. Uh, if they're not in the dark, they might be in the dark at that moment. <laughs> so they will see a, a black earth <laughs> but they should get they should get some sort of view but, but right now they're behind soon after they will see the light of course because you know we are traveling very quickly around the earth well let's find out more about uh, the european space agency astronaut on board that spacecraft tim peak and uh, his training for this mission As the European Space Agency's first British astronaut, Tim Peake is about to make history by travelling to the International Space Station. Having logged over 3,000 flying hours during 17 years with the British Army, he's used to pushing the limits of endurance and technical expertise. Now he faces the ultimate challenge, a long duration stay in orbit. He's had to learn a whole new set of complex skills to prepare him for the mission ahead. I do prefer the sort of hands-on uh, manual tasks such as the robotics and the EVA. I've loved learning about the scientific payloads on board the space station and some of the human physiology experiments we'll be doing are very interesting and I'm really looking forward to perform them as well. 
Peake was chosen for ESA's astronaut corps in 2009, beating over 8,000 other applicants to become one of six new recruits. After basic training, he embarked upon a program designed to prepare him for the extreme isolation of space, spending time living in a lab beneath the ocean and in this underground cave system in Sardinia. He also learnt survival skills in the Russian wilderness, essential in the event that his Soyuz vehicle lands far from rescue. For the upcoming mission, Peek has spent many months training with the space station's international partners, moving between Russia, Canada, Japan, the United States and Europe. I think some of the good surprises have been just working with international partners and of course all the time I've spent in Europe and Europe we are obviously made up of all the member states so just being and working with an ESA you're working with partners from other countries and embracing different cultures as well so I think that's been one of the highlights of, of my time as an astronaut. In orbit there's a huge range of day-to-day -day tasks and operations to perform. At the international centers, simulators are used to recreate various elements of the mission, such as ESA's neutral buoyancy facility in Cologne, where astronauts can practice working outside the station in microgravity. From routine maintenance to emergencies, Peak has learned to anticipate every situation which may occur during spaceflight, an approach which echoes that of his former career. Aviation is a very dynamic environment as well, and you just always have to stay flexible. The plan will invariably change several times before you actually execute it. And I think that's an art, is just learning how to relax and accept that and plan for the different eventualities that may happen. After years of experience at the controls of aircraft, Tim Peek is about to face the most challenging flight of his career. One that will carry him 400 kilometers above the Earth to begin his new life as an ESA astronaut. Back with live pictures now from uh, the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Only a little hazier, but I mean, still amazing visibility. Um, I've covered many of these launches this time of year from Kazakhstan. Um, sometimes you get snow on the ground, sometimes you can barely see the launcher. Um, I think we're going to be, um, you know, assuming everything runs to time, I think we're going to be uh, very lucky for the launch today in around about 25 minutes from now. And so uh, I don't know whether you can hear that. The music you are hearing right now is um, going on inside. Uh, this is what's being played to the, um, the astronauts within the Soyuz capsule. This is the, their playlist, actually. Yeah. So for each, um, for each of them. a little bit of Queen there being played, I assume, for Tim Peake. In fact, Tim Peake is doing a, an awful lot of um, music, various music things on Twitter. So do keep an eye on, um, on Tim Peake on Twitter for the, uh, the music he is doing. Um, what I also wanted to mention that uh, Tim Peake, of course, not the first um, British astronaut. That honor goes to Helen Sharman, who flew to Space Station Mir in 1991. Um, there have also been several other Britain, British born people who've flown into space. Michael Fole, famous NASA astronaut, Piers Sellers, Nick Patrick, and uh, as well as uh, Richard Garriott and Mark Shuttleworth, who holds uh, UK citizenship. But Tim Peake, the first UK European Space Agency astronaut, with the UK now supporting the European Space Agency's human spaceflight program. Now, I mentioned Leo, Helen Sharman. So she flew to Mir in 1991. You flew to Mir as, as well, um, I think in 1998? 98, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how has the technology changed in that time? Or is it, can they expect more or less the same thing? Well, not, not that much. I mean, the, the, the launcher was not the same. Of, of course, that's a new type, has been modernized. The, the Soyuz vehicle has been also modernized, especially for the International Space Station, because they had to accommodate the, uh, the U.S. anthropometric standards. Uh, so the Soyuz was designed for the Russian standards, and uh, so they had to modify it for the, for the uh, non-Russian uh, crew members. Essentially, that's meant being able to fit taller people in. Yeah, because uh, there, are, there were some, uh, of course, the Americans were flying in, in the shuttle where you have 
you can have bigger legs, let's say, and uh, so they, uh, in order to have the, the, the US astronauts flying in the Soyuz, they had to make it inside a little bit bigger in the, in the descent module. Now, we've just seen a, a bit of a snapshot of, of, of Tim's training. How tough has it been? How full on has it been since he was selected? Well, of course, you have a lot of uh, preparation before you're even assigned to a mission. So uh, there is what we call the basic training, and this is lasting one and a half or two years. And then you're waiting for your assignment, and uh, while you're waiting, you're also doing some, uh, let's say, complementary training, um, which is preparing you for the uh, for the task you will have to generic tasks you will have to do in the station, like robotics or EVA or this kind of thing. So EVA, spacewalk. Right, spacewalk, exactly. Yeah, and um, and then when you are assigned to mission, uh, it's usually two years before the launch. So you will have two intense years of uh, training in uh, in the different training centers throughout the world for the the ISS systems, the, uh, the experiments, robotics, EVA, everything with it now specific to your mission. And you're training with your crew at that moment. You start to train with your crew. Now, uh, Tim Peake was selected in 2009. Now, he's um, uh, selected among a group of, uh, what, uh, six, six others. I was counting right. my list here. <laughs> I got my, suddenly my, my, my brain seemed to not able to. <laughs> you, you should do, because you're one of the, you're one of the uh, astronaut corps. Um, yeah. So we had um, Luca Palmatano. He flew in uh, 2013. Alexander Gerst uh, flew in 2014. Uh, Samantha Cristoretti only returned to Earth uh, this year after 200 days in space uh, in June. And then a very short mission for Andreas Mogensen. He flew in September uh, this year. So uh, Tim Peake, uh, the next to fly, and then Thomas Pesquet will fly around this, time next, yeah. ne this, this time next year. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, by my calculations, this means... Uh, over the last year, Tim Peake will be the third to live on the International Space Station, third European Space Agency astronaut to live on the International Space Station in the past 12 months. Uh, yes, true. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we've had mm -hmm. Samantha Cristoretti, Andreas Mogensen, and now, uh, now Tim Peake. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the mission itself. What does Tim Peake's five-month Principia mission involve? Let's find out. The European Space Agency will shortly be making its eighth long-duration mission to the International Space Station. Tim Peake from England will spend five months in orbit, carrying out 30 experiments on behalf of ESA, as well as international research projects. So we'd set up the Columbus VCA as usual. Named Principia after Isaac Newton's groundbreaking text on motion and gravity, the mission has a special emphasis on education. The logo was designed by the winner of a competition held by a British children's television show. We had thousands of entries for this mission patch competition and thousands of entries for the mission name competition, Principia, as well. And I've just been uh, amazed at how everybody really has been engrossed and excited by this mission. Peak will be launched from Baikonur in Kazakhstan on board a Russian Soyuz vehicle. He's scheduled to reach the ISS in around six hours. He'll be traveling alongside NASA's Tim Kopra and Russian cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko, with whom he acted as backup crew for the Expedition 44 flight back in July. Once on board, they'll be involved with the day-to-day -day running of the station. A hugely complex but, uh, procedure, which requires every crew member to be flexible in their responsibilities. So much of our work up there is determined by the visiting vehicle traffic. And that's a very dynamic phase because we're not quite sure exactly which vehicles are going to arrive when. And we get trained on how to do tasks that, that may be planned six months ahead of our mission and maybe plan six months after our mission, so that should there be some flex and those activities fall within our increment, then we're trained and we're ready to do those as well. Okay. Tim Peake's schedule of experiments includes studies in material science, physiology and astrobiology. 
The results will have important implications for industry and medicine back on Earth and will also play a role in developing future spaceflight missions. Educational aspects of Prinkapia are focused on participation, which includes school children being invited to design data collecting apps and communicate with Peak using amateur radio. Spending you know, a few months on board the International Space Station is a really privileged position to be in. And so I'm very keen to maximize that opportunity. And as well as doing all of this important science, I also really want to try and share this mission as much as possible with everybody. And that includes educational outreach that will just hopefully open people's eyes to the world of science and engineering and show that there are some fantastic careers to be had if you choose those paths. For ESA, Brinkapia will mark both the first flight of a British citizen and another step in the continuation of its involvement with the ISS. Europe's regular presence in space means valuable experience for future missions and inspiration for those who will design and take part in them. Sixteen minutes, thirty seconds to launch. Excuse the music. That's what is being played to the crew inside the Soyuz capsule. It's called the descent capsule, the descent module, but actually it's obviously used for ascent as well into space. They're behind that cowling. This is a tradition, playing music to the astronauts, to the cosmonauts that goes back to the time of Yuri Gagarin. The story goes that he was on the uh, on the launch pad, strapped into his tiny space capsule and was getting bored. They were doing all the last minute checks. Probably, and he was alone. He was alone, <laughs> no, on was his own. Single seater. First time <laughs> that anyone had been in one of these. And uh, so they decided Mission Control played him uh, Russian love songs mm -hmm. is, uh, is the story and that is the tradition. So, uh, so now that's what happens. They get a bit of a playlist on uh, the launch pad. And uh, so Inside that um, descent module in there, Tim Peak, Yuri Malenchenko is a Soyuz commander. He takes the center seat. And uh, Tim Copper, a flight engineer for NASA, he's in the left-hand seat. Tim in the right-hand seat. Launch scheduled, and we're still on track for 11.03.10, which is uh, just over 15 minutes time to launch. Uh, so, Leah, what's happening in the spacecraft now? Because so much of this is automatic. Well, I, I guess the excitement is starting to raise a little bit, uh, but uh, you're right, it's, you know, everything is automatic, so you want to make sure that they are, they are closing the visor for the, uh, for the launch. They would be able to open it after the, the insertion into orbit, so after 10 minutes more or less. And uh, so they are waiting, and the crew is not doing a lot during the launch, uh, even in case of big problem, I mean, all the sequence would be automatic and uh, the escape tower will, uh, will be, might be used in the first minutes and then once we have enough energy, enough speed, um, the Soyuz itself might be disconnected from the launcher automatically. So 14 minutes to go now, almost 14 minutes to launch of uh, the Soyuz spacecraft from Baikonur. Um, should say at this time the um, emergency escape system is armed and um, this is the part you can see right at the top of, of the spacecraft. You can see right at the top there. You can even see the little nozzles at the top there. Yep, yeah, yeah. In the, on the thin part of this, of this tower you can see some, some black or dark uh, nozzles. And this, this system is totally autonomous, it doesn't depend on launcher itself. It's uh, automatically triggered in case of, uh, of a rocket failure. Now you've been space twice, um, you flew um, in, in the Soyuz. W what is that feeling, <laughs> we get the, uh, the final countdown playing uh, to, the, uh, to the astronaut, what is that feeling in, when you're in there and you know that there is only you know, 13 minutes to go to launch? <laughs> well, it's... Um, it's a mix of motion, excitement, and concentration also, because and you, you, you still have a few things to do anyway, uh, especially on the, on the shuttle side for the crew who's on, uh, on the flight deck. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
you don't want to be delayed so that's the main thing and uh, uh, the Soyuz of course it's as I told before it's quite reliable in the shuttle you always had this uh, risk of being uh, delayed which is was not very very convenient and nice <laughs> uh, but yeah they so it's that's their moment I mean, uh, and uh, I'm sure that Tim dreamt about that for for years and years now and uh, uh, that's that's great to reach that moment so uh, yes Europe the final countdown that exposes rather my 1980s pop trivia uh, knowledge that's playing at the moment we've had Queen as well 12 minutes or so to go to launch um, and they've got in those same positions um, Assuming the launch goes to plan, another then six hours, they're not going to get up from their, their seats. They've got an awful lot to do. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with this short or shortened uh, launch and rendezvous, but I guess they don't, they don't move too much from their um, decent module. Uh, six hours is not, it's not too long. They don't obviously have to, to do uh, uh, the other module, the orbital module for eating or for um, toilets. Uh, so. Uh, that's that's a very packed also um, uh, phase in the, in the in the launch and, and docking. So very different from what was done in the part when you had to spend 48 hours in, in this small vehicle. So these are live pictures now from yeah. the International mm -hmm. Space Station. Now this is going to start. Um, it's probably the Naya. Yeah. Yes, I was going to say it, it yeah. needs to start edging the color up towards, is very towards yeah. Baikonur. So we will be over. Um, we will be over Baikonur just about three minutes um, before launch. And this is all about the orbital dynamics. So once the Soyuz launches, a series of quite a complicated series of maneuvers to catch up with the International Space Station, it can't be too far ahead of it. Right. And um, it used to be uh, two days to do that, but the Russians managed in the last years to, to find in this new uh, method. It's uh, accelerated rendezvous and docking, but it's uh, less reliable. I mean, a small problem could delay the rendezvous and docking to 40, 48 hours. So everything has to work right for this uh, scheme. Even a few seconds on a, an orbital maneuver. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it happened once, I think, in the, in the last uh, years, in the last two years, that uh, the rendezvous and docking after the launch was delayed to 40 hours. I'm very impressed, Leo, with your uh, geographical knowledge from space. This is, in fact, the Red Sea. <laughs> well, um, this color, flying this over color now. Of, of the land is, is quite unique. I mean, this orange that you see, it's mostly in this uh, Arabic peninsula. Well, we've mentioned the Soyuz. Let's talk about a little bit more detail about the Soyuz spacecraft. It's a remarkable spacecraft. And currently, the only way of getting humans into space. Oh, minus eight minutes. Well, let's locate ourselves geographically, first of all. Baikonur, Leo. Right, in Kazakhstan, in the desert of Kazakhstan. This is the first stage, so they will be jettisoned first. And then just in the middle and top of these four boosters, you have the second stage, uh, which will last a few minutes. And, and then, of course, the third stage, which is where the, the Soyuz is connected. Now, this is showing the escape system. Hopefully, yeah. we won't hope need we to won't use see that. that. Yeah. It's only <laughs> been used once in the whole um, history of, of, of Soyuz manned, of crewed oh, Soyuz yeah, yeah. flights. Mm -hmm. That will drag any problem with the, the launcher itself. That will drag the uh, capsule away from any danger, and then it parachutes back down to Even Earth. Even if you have a problem on the launch pad itself with the rocket. So the safety, safe, safeguard is watching, is, um, is working throughout the, the launch, but with different um, sequences each time. 
So this is not live. This is what we will see uh, during the launch, so um, we hope. Uh, so it leaves uh, the launch pad, all the sections um, together. Right, and we are launching almost vertically, as you can see. That will last about two minutes, and then this, the, the rocket will start to go more and more horizontal. Because first, of course, we want to um, go uh, above the atmosphere, so we, uh, we have no, no drag anymore. And we can accelerate then horizontally to the uh, um, orbit velocity, which is about uh, 7.5 kilometers per second which is quite a speed. <laughs> quite a speed. Now, they're called strap-on boosters, but actually they just drop away this once the they run out stage. of fuel. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and then the, you see that the, um, the second stage is also controlling the, uh, the trajectory. So there is, uh, of course, uh, some computers who are driving the, the direction of the, of the burn of the, of the stages, the rocket stages. And in this um, schematic, you can see the whole trajectory so the, the, the whole thing will last about eight, and eight minutes and 50 seconds. It's phenomenal. And actually, even with that, the G-forces are not too bad, are they? <coughs> Only around two uh, Gs, up to like three, that. Up to three, yeah. yeah. So it's a progressive. Each time a stage is separating, then you have a short stop in the acceleration, and then it starts again to raise up to three Gs. So that's a and profile. Then it's, it's the third stage that um, takes us um, into orbit and... Um, Yes, about 8 minutes 48, something like that, but it's, it's but slightly approximate. Mm -hmm. um, so here we, the third stage uh, is uh, cut off and, and uh, the Soyuz is separated and automatically that will trigger the deployment of the solar array of the, of the Soyuz and also of the, you see the two antennas on the, on the front. So the little ears, these are part of the docking system. Right, they are radar antennas for... Uh, watching the station and uh, helping the navigation system. So we're back live with some live pictures from inside the cap. Surely appreciate these sort of pictures come and go as uh, the uh, launch progresses and also you know they're not the uh, they're not the highest uh, quality pictures again you'll appreciate they're on a little closed circuit camera from inside the capsule these are live images from inside uh, the spacecraft uh, with just over uh, five minutes uh, to launch now getting close <coughs> getting very close uh, to launch I'm just trying to work out the angle Point of uh, that camera there I think we were seeing um, Tim Copra and um, the commander in that in that image, and no. there'll be two cameras. Uh, it, that gives you a sense of how cramped the Soyuz is. Right. That you cannot see all the astronauts at the same time. You need two cameras because, and all this baggage as well above them. Right, and your knees are bent also. That's what the harder thing I, I would say. Um, so far, the suit is not inflated. So it's easier, but if the suit for some reason is inflated, then it could be become a little bit harder on the knees. Um, but here we see from the right, Richard from the right side, so we see uh, Yuri Malenchenko on, on the left side and, and uh, Tim Copra on the right side of the picture. And uh, we're into the, the final events really before, before launch here with. Um, Everything getting into a, a, an automatic mode uh, now, and right. really, you're in a stage where you can override things, but you don't. There's no start button or anything like that. No, no, nothing like that. And uh, the crew is informed, of course, if the safeguard is, is triggered, and uh, on the launch pad, it can be triggered, I think, by the launch control center, and then it it, it, it will be both. It can be automatic or triggered by the ground also. If, uh, Rocket, for instance, is not going on the right trajectory, so there will be something to be done by, by the launch control center. And also, there is no uh, formal countdown um, with uh, Russian Russian spacecraft, and then there never has been. There's never been a. You mean inside? In, uh, inside, there's no, no right. one does a big a big countdown, nothing like Run that. Um, the last so seconds, probably, there will. But be uh, again, yeah. it's it's automatic unless you you stop it. Right. True. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the crew under three minutes now uh, to launch. Two valves closed. Behind the fairing at the top, you can hear the communication now between uh, ground control and the uh, capsule, just verifying that what they say on the ground, what they're seeing on the instruments on the ground is what they're seeing in the spacecraft. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And no more music. I think we're all grateful for that, Leo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a little over two minutes now to launch. What we'll see in the next um, final two minutes uh, is some more of these gantries moving away uh, from Booster the, tank pressure the launcher. So you can see a, a, a um, confirmation there, booster propellant tank pressurization. What does that mean, Leo? Um, well, that means that the um, inside the, the rocket uh, boosters and stages, the, the propellant is at the right pressure. So I guess that means they will also disconnect some of these uh, cranes which are feeding the, the second and third stage in, uh, very shortly. And the last one will be the bottom ones for the, for the four boosters. We're still seeing there, we're seeing um, Tim Kupra and uh, Yuri Malenchenko, the uh, commander in the central seat. And Tim Kupra is the NASA astronaut. He's in the right-hand seat of the Soyuz spacecraft. Sadly, Tim Peake uh, is hidden from view in this picture. And uh, you'll appreciate these are not pictures we control. These are pictures uh, that yeah, come Yeah, but it, from it, would, it will be video. changed during the launch. Uh, so after a few minutes, uh, they're switching to the other side. So we... We're going to see Tim during the launch, definitely. So now we're a little over one minute to launch of Soyuz spacecraft. And you see on the right hand of uh, Yuri, of the commander, there, he has a small stick because he's trapped on his uh, seat and uh, he cannot reach some of the commands, so he needs an extension of his arm. to internal power. So the final gantry is moving away and now 30 seconds to launch. Auto sequence initiate. Ignition. service tower separation. Soyuz carrying ESA astronaut Tim Peake on his Principia mission to the International Space Station. On board the Soyuz spacecraft, Tim Peake in the left-hand seat, Yuri Malenchenko, Soyuz commander in the center seat, Tim Kopra, flight engineer for NASA in the right-hand seat. Beautiful clear skies over the Baikonur Cosmodrome as the Soyuz disappears into the sky. Starting to see the condensate trails. Vehicles, obviously, uh, 
rushing to the uh, to the pad there. This is uh, what's uh, happening. What we're looking at now is an animation, and uh, the next event we can expect is the separation of the emergency escape system, and uh, right at the uh, top of the spacecraft. Two minutes and uh, separating the boosters. And there we see. That's very, very nice. Marvelous picture of the boosters flying away. You could even see them toppling away. Yeah. This is why. Very good lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely amazing. This is why they launch from the middle of a desert. <laughs> True. So look at that. Isn't that spectacular? The um, boosters, the se the just falling away, tumbling over themselves, and you can see that brightest star. And the trail behind it, that's the Soyuz, heading now into, into space. So they have good report from the launcher. So everything is fine. So what we're now expecting is the, uh, the fairing separation at 2 minutes 38 seconds after launch. And uh, the next major event, the um, second stage separation. So you see the uh, spacecraft disappearing into the skies over Baikonur. And I'm not sure whether we can go to the, uh, the capsule pictures. Oh, well, there we go, the, uh, the launch pad. 210 control parameters nominal. Only a few minutes ago, that had the Soyuz. The Soyuz now heading into orbit. We can't see it anymore, so we're watching, obviously this is an animation, of what is happening on the Soyuz. All systems are nominal at the moment. The uh, second stage, Leo, is firing at yeah, the moment. right, second stage. And uh, the third stage will ignite before the second stage is uh, jettisoned. And Here we uh, see live pictures from inside the capsule. UK ESA astronaut Tim Peake there Two, in the left-hand, uh, the right-hand seat sorry, of the uh, Soyuz Copy, spacecraft, I got it. I got it. and a view out of the window. Yeah, you can see the Earth, and you can see also the uh, orientation of uh, of the rocket, uh, still vertical, but uh, going slowly horizontal. So we're approaching second stage separation now. We'll just wait to hear that the uh, systems, all systems are, are nominal on that. About halfway into the launch. 290 seconds. Third stage activation confirmed. So third stage activation confirms means the third stage starts firing before the second stage finishes firing. We're now on the third stage. Third stage will take the Soyuz to orbit. That would be the last one. Back now live inside the capsule. Um, you're seeing now uh, Yuri Malenchenko, the commander, and uh, the other Tim, Tim Copper for NASA, in the left-hand seat. And I'm sure we can tell that Team Peak is an astronaut now because we are above the 100 kilometers. So that's over the 50 miles. <laughs> so that's the. Uh, so Britain when you has. Become, you become an astronaut. Britain right. has another <laughs> astronaut today. True. And Europe has another astronaut right. today. Three <laughs> forty seconds. All parameters nominal. As you're hearing, the communication translated between the spacecraft and uh, mission control that all systems are nominal. This is the main uh, Moscow control room uh, monitoring. This is for the space station monitoring the flight. In fact, you've got uh, everything there. You've got the capsule images inside the, uh, the spacecraft. Uh, you've got the animation, similar to the animations we're seeing. Houston, well, everyone calm there as well. That's the Houston uh, main control room for the space station. And here's Stage the control three, room here at Oberpfaffenhofen near copy. Munich in Germany. This is the Columbus uh, control room. So overseeing operations in the European Columbus Laboratory on the space station. We're just above the control room there overlooking uh, the control room. 
again once again inside the Soyuz capsule. See just how um, how cramped that is there. We may lose these pictures. Um, if we have them, what's always good to see is just as we enter orbit, you see that uh, that weightlessness uh, as it goes into space. You will see things suddenly move around in that in that right. spacecraft. And the signal is not going through the satellite, so you, that's why we are losing signal after. Um, maybe nine or ten minutes sometimes it's a little bit longer so it's, it's a so direct far, so link back to right. um, over the Russian or ground or side. Or over the, the Russian uh, ter ground Russian territory yeah. Copy. so all systems uh, looking good We're on the third stage which will take us up to orbit um, the whole flight from ground to orbit only eight minutes 49 seconds it's very quick to go to the skies <laughs> <laughs> and what you see on the fo foreground here is an indicator of the, the gravity level and uh, you can see that starting to float when we get to orbit which is arriving now in about 45 seconds 480 seconds parameter is nominal uh, copy your transmission Almost 300 tons of fuel. I said it was only an almost a nine-minute flight to orbit, but it needs 300 or so tons of fuel to make it uh, that far. It's 20 seconds left now. And a lot of fuel has been used. <laughs> 510 seconds. Uh, pitch your and roll nominal. That means it's on track. The trajectory is, is uh, correct. There we go. There we go. We are in orbit. So it's very quiet on board. <laughs> the Soyuz has successfully reached orbit now. It's due to take just six hours to change orbit and catch up with the International Space Station. Now, many things have to happen in that time, so it, there may be delays on the way, but so far, Everything's gone so far, everything absolutely on track. perfectly, hasn't it? And, and very nice. Yeah. Useful. Perfect. So it was um, fantastic to see that uh, that movement when you suddenly get into orbit. Suddenly we've got a microgravity okay. environment. It's like hitting a wall, actually, <laughs> because it stops very, very quickly. And, uh, very I'll read you out clear. How us? And uh, this is the point where, although they've got a lot to do, there's a bit of a, they can have a, a, a few minutes to acclimatise to what's going on, and just checking that everything is happening on the spacecraft that's meant to happen. Right, and especially the deployment of, of the uh, solar arrays and, and the antennas, which is in principle automatic, but the crew can uh, intervene if needed to help the deployment. So this is the uh, animation again of what should happen, and um, the uh, solar arrays will deploy, gives Soyuz power uh, in orbit, and also the uh, almost like ears um, that uh, come out of the of the front, the in orbit uh, section of of the uh, Soyuz, and that's part of the the docking system, part of the radar system to be able to find and and reach the international right. space station. Yeah, yeah. So there is a navigation system, obviously, and the the radar is helpful, especially in the when you're coming closer to the station. So there is a radar for long distance and one for short distance. And uh, that allows to dock automatically, of course, uh, if in general, automatically. But the crew can uh, take over, the commander can take over and uh, perform manual docking if needed. Looks like we've um, lost now the um, pictures from inside the capsule. That's nothing to worry about, as we were saying. That's just a, a link down between the Soyuz and Russian territory. Of course, the Soyuz now passed away from uh, Russian territory. Um, what um, we are uh, now seeing on the main display board there to the left-hand side is some of the telemetry, the information coming back from the Soyuz. Um, and this is almost exactly the same as um, they can see in, in the capsule, yeah, the sort of information they can see in the capsule. That's the display of the, of the commander, I guess. I'm not sure, but uh, one of the two. And the, 
you have the same display on the left seat for Team Copa, and uh, of course they can choose their display. But this is what the crew sees. So it's fantastic. They all they've made it into into orbit. Now it's um, looking at um, just to check the full deployment of everything within within the Soyuz and make sure that the vehicle is tight. Also, that there is no atmosphere leak. And so they're going to do uh, some, let's say, health check of the whole vehicle in the next minutes. But we can say that um, Tim Peake is, is now officially an astronaut. An astronaut, yeah. Uh, and for a long time now. <laughs> an astronaut. Months. So from the uh, 2009 group selected by the European Space Agency, we now have Luca Palmitano, Alexander Gers, <laughs> Samantha <laughs> Christoforetti, <laughs> Andreas <laughs> Mogensen, <laughs> and Tim Peake. And Tim Peake. <laughs> All European Space Agency astronauts. Well, as you've seen, we've been broadcasting today from the Columbus Control Center, which is part of the much bigger German Space Operations Center. It's an impressive campus here at Oberpfaffenhofen uh, near Munich, which includes control rooms for not only the ISS, but satellites and Europe's new satellite navigation system, Galileo. The German Space Operations Center has successfully executed more than 60 space missions since 1969. Missions with different purposes involving spacecraft of all kinds. Spaceflight contributes significantly to the shaping of our lives. Space research brings us new insight into the origins of the solar system, the planets, and with that knowledge of life itself. Satellites provide important data about our environment and make global communications possible. Most communication satellites are orbiting at an altitude of about 36,000 kilometers. Challenging best describes the task of precisely positioning and operating them. For many years, this has been one of the primary functions of the GSOC. Earth observation satellites use many methods of measurement. The data they gather is interesting for research and business applications. Ground stations equipped with antennas are needed to communicate with the spacecraft. The GSOCs are located at the central German ground station in Weilheim, which is home to a range of antennas. Data exchanges between the control room and satellites takes place via these dishes. Multi-mission operation is a speciality of the German Space Operations Center. From the control room, technicians can control several satellites simultaneously. The method is flexible and efficient. A sister control center, the GCC, is the core of the Galileo project. The European Global Positioning System has 30 satellites that will provide a level of precision in navigation, making many new applications possible. On-orbit servicing includes inspection, towing and maintenance of satellites in orbit. New special procedures for space robotics are being developed to make it possible. Together with DLR's Robotic Institute, the EPOS facility has been set up for the optimization of maneuvers. Approach and docking between two satellites are being simulated here. The operation of the European Space Laboratory, Columbus, is directed from the GSOC. More than 100 scientists and engineers work here. The control room is manned round the clock to monitor and control the Space Laboratory's technical systems, as well as to support the astronauts aboard the ISS as they work on scientific experiments.
The GSOC is the leading European facility for manned spaceflight. Station Munich for Mike. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure working with you. And here we are back live at uh, the Columbus Control Center at Oberpfaffenhofen. Um, the Soyuz on its way now to the International Space Station. Perfect launch uh, today, Leo. Everything happened when it was meant to happen. Wonderful launch and uh, very nice weather. And, and perfect launch. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll show you that again in, in just a moment because uh, just uh, really very, very lucky with the, uh, the, with the weather there. As far as we know, um, everything's nominal on the, uh, the Soyuz. Looks like. Yeah. So um, if there are any issues, um, we will, of course, keep you posted on the European Space Agency website. So um, Tim Peake, ESA astronaut, Yuri Malenchenko, the uh, Soyuz commander, and Tim Copra, flight engineer for NASA, on their way to the International Space Station. Expedition 46 and 47, Copy. and Tim Peake's Principia mission. Currently on the International Space Station, waiting for them. Scott Kelly, commander for the US. He's on his uh, one-year mission. He's been there since March the 27th, 2015, so almost nine months on the space station. As has Mikhail Konyenko, also um, nine months into his one-year mission. And uh, the other uh, cosmonaut on the station, Sergei Volkov. So, um, if all goes to plan, in six hours' time or so, um, they will be joined by three more astronauts bringing the complement of the ISS back to six. Well, thanks, Leo, for uh, joining welcome. me today. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, I'm Richard Hollingham here at the uh, Columbus Control Room in Munich. And uh, we've been watching this morning. So you.